group, uh, actually several of us do a little bit of work with a group called the Cooperative Economics Alliance of New York City, or CNIC. Shout out CNIC. Uh, and Evan from CNIC is over here and has a number of pieces of work, including the uh, brand new New York City Cooperative Economy Directory, which is like a yellow pages for co-ops, uh, or white pages, I don't know, I'm not old enough to remember. Um, <laughs> But it's got all the co-ops in it. Um, at any rate, as somebody who works nationally but lives here in the uh, really a thrill for me to be on this panel uh, with these incredible New York Solidarity Economy organizers. Um, I think in this room, it's like not controversial to say that this is a challenging moment and one in which it's really easy to feel a certain sense of hopelessness and I think in that context, there's really something to be said for getting our hands dirty and doing things ourselves, like moving our money into community development credit unions, starting work-around businesses, uh, joining a food co-op, fighting for affordable housing through community land trusts. And that isn't just because we want to run off into our own little utopias or because we think that that local work is somehow easier than conventional politics, because, spoiler alert, it isn't. Um, but because... Building, um, building community controlled economic institutions actually allows us to fight back on a couple of different really important fronts all at the same time. Um, it allows us to build economic power, right? So uh, to divest from corporate capitalism and to meet the needs of our people and our movements ourselves. Um, and I think this bar is actually a, a great example of that. Um, it allows us to build political power. We're talking about new bases for uh, flexing democratic muscle, developing leaders, um, doing a lot of the things that in the past we've looked at institutions like the labor movement who are really struggling with decline right now to do for us. Um, and maybe most importantly, it allows us to build narrative power um, by creating more and more examples that show that when it comes to economics, uh, there are viable and humane alternatives to the profit-maximizing corporation as a form. Um, and these aren't new ideas, right? The earliest labor movements in the U.S. and the U.K. all understood, you know, groups like the, the Knights of Labor understood at like a deep, deep level that we needed mutual aid and cooperation as part of our strategies to build what they call the cooperative commonwealth, what we talk about as the solidarity economy or the new economy. Um, and the same could be said for the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, the Black Panther Party, the Zapatistas, the European Greens, I could go on and on and on and on, but there's, there's a rich history globally, and there's a rich history in New York City. The history we won't get into as much on this panel, but we are going to talk a lot about what's happening now um, and the ecosystem for this work here in New York. Um, and before I do that, I just want to get a sense of, of this room and where the solidarity economy is in this room. Um, so I want to ask for how many people here are members of a credit union? Right on, awesome. Lauren, did you want to actually make a quick shout out about that? I just realized this is an opportune yeah, moment. That's true. Uh, well, a lot of folks here who live in the neighborhood, in Bushwick, there's a community development credit union, which is a particular subset of credit unions that uh, have a mission of serving marginalized communities, um, which include immigrant communities, and some color, low income communities, and creating uh, financial products and services that serve those communities. So that is located just south of Myrtle Wyckoff in Bushwick, and it's an awesome credit union, the Brooklyn Cooperative Federal Credit Union. If you would like more information, you can Google it. Or what do you Google? It's the Brooklyn Cooperative Federal Credit Union, and it is, has two locations, one in Bed-Stuy and one in Bushwick. Awesome. Thank you, and thank you for that would be a pause for a second also. Um, so who here is a member of a food co-op or another kind of consumer? Also, we got some, some food co-op people in there. Um, what about anybody here involved with a worker-owned business? Yeah? Awesome. Yeah. Yay. Um, what about community gardeners? A couple community gardeners? Awesome. Solidarity economy is rich in this room. Um, and how about the informal solidarity economy? So not necessarily businesses, but like who here like helps out on a regular basis, a friend or a neighbor or a family member with, with things that are you know, economic in nature, care work or what have you, not for money, but out of a sense of like, these are my people, this is solidarity, right? Yeah, most of us, cool. So the solidarity 
uh, is here in the room with us. Um, and I'm, wow. Uh, I'm excited to get into a conversation about with all of you, um, but particularly excited to introduce the three really awesome folks that I have up here with me tonight. Um, the first of whom is Lauren Hudson, Lauren Taylor Hudson, um, who has been a member of Solidarity NYC, a volunteer collective of organizers and academics who promote, connect, and support New York City's solidarity economy. And she's been part of that since 2012. Um, she's currently a doctoral student in Earth and Environmental Sciences and really in geography. Okay, so the department is closed. Okay. Um, <laughs> at the Kennedy Graduate Center. Uh, Where's. Can I see her? Yes. Here you go. Uh, yeah, that's so much better. Um, uh, where she writes about anti capitalist organizing among women in New York City. Um, Lauren lives in Brooklyn, where she tweets about the solidarity economy and bad television at Blacktivist with no K. I don't want people to get along. Um, Sinif Sial is the coordinating director of the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives. She is a Pakistani American who grew up exploring the woods of Akron, Ohio, and moved to New York City in 2000, where she's been working as a community organizer, direct service provider, and cooperative development developer for over a decade with various community-based organizations throughout the city. Uh, formerly as the director of Make the Road New York Workforce Development Services, that have launched and grew a unique workforce program that addressed the needs of immigrant communities through the integration of workers' rights and occupational health and safety training, the building of strong citywide partnerships, and the co-development of worker cooperatives that aim to create quality jobs and offer living wages. Siddharth holds a BA from NYU and a master's from Columbia where she focused on economic and political development and global labor issues. As a strong believer in worker control and workplace democracy, she constantly dreams of an end to exploitation in every workplace. And I also want to especially shout out Siddharth because she's working on the Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy, which is a massive undertaking and is the next weekend, and was kind enough with her time to come out for this. Um, and lastly, we have Laura Wolfong, who is a uh, program and operations coordinator for the New Economy Project, uh, which is a member of the New Economy Coalition. It all sort of becomes acronym soup at one point. But um, with New Economy Project, um, who are a New York City economic justice organization who partner with community groups uh, to build a new economy that works for all based on principles of cooperation, democracy, equity, racial justice, and ecological sustainability. Lauren facilitates new economy and financial justice workshops in English and Spanish for community groups throughout the city, is active in several coalitions, and co-chairs the education and outreach group for the New York City Community Land Initiative. Lauren first joined New Economy Project in 2013 as a community outreach and advocacy intern, and then graduated from NYU in 2014 with a BA in political culture, education, and organization, before returning to the New Economy Project in the fall of 2014 as a full-time staffer. Let's hear it for our panel of amazing guests. Cool. So uh, I'm going to start uh, with you, Lauren, to pass the mic, um, to talk a little bit about Solidarity NYC, your journey to the Solidarity Economy, that whole mapping of New York Solidarity Economy that you did, and what's what's come out of that, what possibilities have emerged from, from making that, that map and that uh, space visible to people. Thanks, Mikey. I think it's like a Lauren sandwich, too. So, hi, everyone. Thank you for coming here on a Monday. Thank you, Starbar, for hosting us. It's a wonderful place. I was telling people that this is my third time in seven days of being here. That's just how wonderful it is, not like school's out and I'm just like living my life or something. But yeah. So, as Mikey mentioned, I am a collective member of Solidarity NYC. Solidarity NYC is an organizing collective um, of artists and activists and recent academics, some of us transitioned into grad school, that's really working to promote and support the solidarity economy in New York. Now when we talk about the solidarity economy, there's several other kind of terms that we talk about. We talk about a cooperative economy, we talk about new economy, etc. and there's like overlapping practices, but we use the term solidarity economy because that has a particular historical context in terms of the um, anti-austerity organizing of the 80s and 90s in Latin America. And it's only more recently, though the practices are tales all this time, but only a more recent kind of cohesive movement in North America since 
like last 15 years. So we're really putting ourselves in alignment with those struggles um, 20 years ago. So Solidarity MIC's goal, uh, when it started in like 2009, was to be able to connect people that were doing similarly aligned work in terms of values. So our two projects that really helped us do this were our mapping project and our deep listening and movement building project. Um, I feel like many of you who are organizers will know that kind of the first step in political organ organizing and consciousness raising work is mapping out the space, right? And seeing what you have. So our mapping project was a way for people to actually name solidarity economy organizations based on what we have decided are these five principles that are well, I think, agreed upon of mutualism, sustainability, democracy, social justice. Oh, crap. Mutualism? Man, this is a bad test. Let's say four. So, <laughs> so basically, uh, economy is driven by ethics and values. You got it. So what does that mean? That means uh, co-ops, CSAs, uh, any kind of mutual aid, which is often overlooked but has a very deep history in New York. Um, anything like sliding scale, bartering, time banks, which had a big moment about five years ago here in the city. Um, so we were trying to put all of that on the map just to see what is the actual breadth of this, uh, of these practices. They're not necessarily aligned in any kind of movement yet. This is about five years ago. So once we did that, we were allowed to see what kind of practitioners were existing where, and that really translated into our deep listening and movement building project. It's interesting because we just used it as a way to take kind of a, a poll, we'll say, and then we found people that were coming to our work through the map and using it as more of a directory, which now we have the directory, which is like kind of the end of this trajectory here. Uh, so our deep listening and movement building project was uh, basically an ethnography of the solidarity economy space. So we interviewed 30 solidarity economy practitioners in this city, so people that worked in credit unions or people that were community gardeners, et cetera. And we asked them like very basic questions, which was, why do you do this work? What's hard? What's cool? What do you need? And what was crucial is what kind of gaps do you have that you imagine could be filled by people doing similarly aligned work, right? Which is kind of like the crux of organizing, right? And connecting people. Do you see a gap in your work that you can see is actually recognizable that someone else fills that has the same kind of value system? And so from those responses, which is on our website, Growing a Resilient City, which that's the remainder of the report, but if you go to solidaritynyc.org, we have it all there, it's beautiful. Um, from those interviews, we were able to kind of cull a list of top like needs, right? Obviously, uh, needs for just to be like capitalized, right? To have money to do the work is a huge one, um, but also the needs for things like shared space, right? And also needs for political education, right? We're strongly like vocalized things. So from that, we led a series of town halls that were sector by sector, and we did that for about a year. So we had a, okay, food co-op and food justice town hall, and people talked about what do you need in that space, et cetera. So it's a lot of polling and reporting back, and I just wanted to kind of underscore that, that a lot of this work isn't necessarily like the like sexy direct action stuff, not to like knock it, but it's the institution building stuff. Um, and it took a very long time. But from that, we were able to build an incubate scenic, which we've already mentioned, the Cooperative Economic Alliance of New York City, which is really meant to be a kind of mutual aid organization of solidarity economy um, workers and practitioners, and it's meant to kind of support that work. So can we connect credit unions to worker co-ops and there's a line of credit so that people can start more just and democratic ways of living and doing it, right? Can we create an institution um, that supports political education, which always needs to happen in parallel to all of this like business building, which is why we have the Cooperative Leadership Institute, which is a way for people to go and train one another about the basic principles of working together and what I would just call home training of being in a movement <laughs> and being like, appropriate. Um, and it's a history of the solidarity economy. I take it as a way for like home training, but whatever. That's, We'll get to that in the Q&A. Um, so all of that work happens in kind of parallel, right? So you have the 
getting people in the same space and vocalizing needs and filling gaps thing, but at the same time, you have to have this consciousness building art. And so I think that's like a great kind of transition into work that I do as a grad student, because my work is focused on, like Mikey said, um, women doing anti-capitalist organizing in this city, because women, and particularly women of color, represent 98% of the solidarity economy work that happens in the city. Um, that was research that we done a couple of years ago. So my kind of, I don't know, thrust being in this work is talking about how consciousness raising and how political consciousness raising in particular creates what we would call a movement space, and then how does that change our experience of living in the city. Um, so that was a lot. I didn't talk about my journey, but I don't know if you guys are interested in my journey. But yeah, I would like to say like the, the consciousness raising part alongside the political organizing, though it not, might not be the sexy work that we all want to do, it is absolutely necessary for the longevity of the solidarity economy movement in the city. That's Are, uh, can be you know, completely autonomous in 
and uh, run on their own. So we've seen worker co-ops form that way. We've seen them form through, there's a, academies. Um, there's one in, in the South Bronx, for example, who worker cooperatives, which runs like a five to six month intensive training program where various groups participate in a long-term training and come out of it building a business plan and so on. Um, and right now we're seeing more and more focus on conversions, um, the conversion of traditional businesses uh, by owners that are either retiring or trying to sell their business. And there's a lot of opportunity for that right now with um, an increasing retiring population in the baby boomer generation. So there's been more focus and support around that. And um, also co-ops have been self-formed. So um, people that you know are able to do it on their, uh, on their own or with minimal support. So we've seen that happen in the city as well. And I would just say that the, the largest worker co-op in the country is located in the Bronx. It's Cooperative Home Care Associates, um, which is 200, or, I'm sorry, 2,000 members strong. Um, and has been around since 1980. So uh, that's often looked at as a model of inspiration across the country. And um, you know, maybe about three years ago, there weren't many worker co-ops. Um, uh, there were about like 20, and that's probably tripled. Now we're about 65 and growing in just a few years, and a large part of that was due to support from the local city council for worker cooperatives. In about 2014, a lot of uh, groups of nonprofits and technical support providers, which includes legal um, supports and financial organizations that give legal, legal support or financial support. So these groups came together along with Nick Knock to advocate in the city council for funding for the development of worker co-ops. And in 2014, it kind of happened very quickly, and I think it was riding off the back of a, a more progressive city council and a mayor who was talking about inequality. Um, and so it was an opportunity, right, to, to talk about cooperatives. And in 2014, the city uh, basically decided to support worker co-op development at 1.2 million. That grew to 2.34 million dollars the next year, and then just today, um, I'm pleased to announce that we have grown that support again to three million, or a little bit over three million. So you can expect, yeah, you can, uh, you can expect even more support for worker co-ops and the development of worker co-ops in New York City. Um, and if you want more info on the various groups and that ecosystem, we can talk about that more. Um, but uh, I will say that while that support is amazing and great and has led to this growth, uh, what we've done at NICNAP working with worker owners of worker co-ops is identify other needs um, and other needs that are of direct interest to worker co-ops. And so we're working towards building you know, a platform that includes the right to space for worker co-ops um, in the city and, and worker co-op centers. Um, that includes a better procurement policy so that the city is contracting more and more with co-ops and, uh, and a public awareness campaign to kind of promote education in the broader public around worker co-ops. Um, and you know, there's still tons of people that don't know what co-ops are or that they exist in the city and so spreading that messaging and that word. Um, and so these are kinds of ideas that have emerged directly from worker properties themselves and we're working towards building kind of policy at, like platform around those concerns and those needs and pushing the limits of what you can ask for beyond just the traditional support. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, and I would just also say that there's been a huge interest from a variety of other movements um, and institutions uh, around worker co-ops. We've seen increased union support and unions that are engaging in worker co-op development. Um, there is an amazing project happening in Brooklyn uh, with Interfaith Hospital right now where um, where uh, you know there are 1199 workers, but Interfaith is a hospital that was in threat of closing down uh, many times, and each time the workers organized to fight the closing of the hospital, and because of that, the workers feel a lot of ownership for that hospital, and so there's 
thinking around um, starting to have some departments that are cooperatively run, um, and eventually the hospital itself. Uh, but then also working with Brooklyn Navy Yard to develop kind of along the supply chain cooperatives that can support the hospital with goods and services. And so it's a very big uh, project, it's dreaming very big, and there are unions and people getting involved, um, you know, kind of outside of what we've already been seeing happening. So that's really exciting. You know, we've seen cooperatives being promoted in, um, in the platform for Movement for Black Lives, um, and other movements as well. And so it's, a, it's an exciting moment to really push worker co-ops forward and uh, as solutions. And so, um, so we're, that's also something else we're working towards and looking forward to. Um, and I don't know if we should talk about the conference now or, okay, so we'll come back to that. So, um a little bit of a framework of just the breadth of the solidarity economy. We dove a little bit into the worker co-op sector, and now we're going to turn to something that I think is probably near and dear to everyone's anxieties in the room, and that's land and housing uh, in New York City. And so, Lauren, can you talk a little bit about the New Economy Project and your work? I'm oh, sorry, I'm supposed to speak into the mic for the live stream, which I think you um, I'll just yell. I, I, was, I was just going to ask Lauren to... Uh, <laughs> It's good to just ask Laura to talk a little bit about um, land and housing and the solidarity economy in New York. All right. Um, thank you, Mike. So um, just before I get into the, the land and housing question, um, a little bit of background on how we got into this work and how we started looking at, I'm going to talk about community land trusts and housing associations specifically. Um, so. New Economy Project is a relatively new um, name. We've, uh, we changed our name to New Economy Project uh, just a few years ago, but we have been around for over 20 years as the Neighborhood Economic Development Advocacy Project, um, which maybe you can guess why we changed our names. A bit of a mouthful. Um, but it was, it was more than just uh, to simplify, it was also because we were trying to move more towards after 20 plus years of fighting banks and corporations and uh, doing a lot of sort of what we now call like revolutionary reform. Um, really wanting to move more into an affirmative approach to economic justice and not just fighting uh, the things that we didn't want and things that were hurting our communities uh, and extracting wealth from our communities, but specifically invest our time and energy in also building and supporting the growth of uh, economically just, environmentally just, racially just uh, models for cooperative development. Um, so for us, that's meant so far uh, working a lot, you know, supporting community development credit unions as we were talking about earlier, which are an alternative to what we think of as traditional banks, uh, but are member controlled, uh, lend within the community and are not extractive in their um, approach to financial services. Um, to also support worker cooperatives, so we're we've been part of the Worker Cooperative Support Network, which is the sort of emerging, re-emerging coalition of organizations that Steph was speaking about earlier. Um, that are working to support the growth of worker co-ops in New York City uh, and also a member of Scenic. Uh, but our biggest sort of campaign in recent years, um, particularly, has been to push for community land trusts in New York City, which are a non-commodified uh, model for housing and land use, um, which sounds kind of crazy in New York City in 2017. Um, but uh, that came for us out of lots of years of fighting for fair housing, anti-discrimination, doing work around the predatory um, lending that was happening for subprime mortgages that led to our housing crisis, and really wanting a model that actually addressed the root causes of gentrification and homelessness in New York City. And uh, so several years ago, probably about six years ago, we uh, got together with a group called Picture the Homeless, which is a homeless-led um, civil rights organization here in New York City based in East Harlem, they work across the city, um, and they work for the rights of homeless people, uh, including particularly the right to housing. And so both of our organizations were looking at the time increasingly into community land trust as a model to address root causes of homelessness uh, and housing crisis, which has only gotten worse, unfortunately, since um, that time when we first started looking at this model. Um, so just really quickly, I'm not going to spend too much time on the sort of technicalities um, now, just because we only have a few minutes, uh, but I'm happy to answer more questions later. Uh, community land trust is a way of taking land out of the private speculative market. 
Um, so instead of it being controlled by an individual, where we think about private ownership, it's held by a nonprofit, which is governed by the community where the land is. Um, and it, uh, the majority of people on the board must live in the community, um, and the full board must have a stake in the community in some way or another. It separates the ownership of land from what's built on top of it, which is another kind of defining feature, uh, which creates a sort of system of checks and balances. So you have the community land trust, I'm just going to call it a CLT for uh, everyone's sake, CLT, which is uh, controlling the land and sort of stewarding the land and ensuring that the land stays in the, in the public good and, and, and sort of the interests of the community that lives there. Uh, and they oversee the use of that land. So they will lease for 99 years the buildings or other uses, for example, a park or a garden uh, on top of the land uh, to typically another community-based organization um, of some kind, which also usually um, must have you know, majority community members um, in leadership. Uh, and the mandate of the community land trust is to ensure that the land is being put to use that benefits the community that lives there. Um, so, you know, for us, we saw that the housing crisis at its root was coming down to the fact that, like everything under capitalism, um, housing and land are treated as a commodity, uh, which means that they're seen as a product to be bought and sold to the highest bidder. Um, and the main purpose is not to house people or to meet human needs, but to make profit. Um, and coming from that, the other major issue that we were seeing was that, um, you know, whoever the person that gets to decide what is being done with the uh, with the land and the housing, etc., uh, is whoever can afford to pay for it, um, regardless of whether they live in the community or don't live in the community. Um, we're seeing increasingly in New York City a lot of investment from overseas. People who may have never even been to you know New York City, let alone Bushwick or Bed Stuy, um, but who are using you know individuals and corporations that are basically using housing as an investment, a sound investment with a high rate of return, um, and don't particularly care even whether the housing is rented, let alone you know, in an affordable and responsible manner, um, and have no interest in the long-term stake of the community that's living there. So uh, we see that community land trusts and other forms of community-led housing cooperatives as being uh, a model that can address these root causes. Um, they, first of all, they have a sort of longevity and, and permanency that most of our housing policy does not have in New York City. Unfortunately, um, despite the progressive administration that we have, we still have a market-based approach to housing, which doesn't address these root causes that I mentioned. Um, and so the, the mayor's housing plan is investing over $40 billion over the course of 10 years, mostly into private development um, that has some restrictions for affordability um, but under New York City law right now, those are you know maxed out at like 30 years, and that's considered permanent in New York City. Um, so as I think most of us would agree, 30 years is not permanent, uh, especially if we're thinking about you know living here, our lives, our children's lives, the, the legacy of a neighborhood. Um, so a, a CLT is a way of getting you know hundreds of years of, of affordability and permanency um, through this the legal structure of the CLT, which ensures that it is stays in the community's interest and benefit and cannot be sold back to the private market. Um, and then the other big piece of that is that we see it as a vehicle for community control and community organizing um, because you have this structure that ensures that the majority of the board and the leadership of the CLT uh, are people living in the community. There's a system of balances. So you have a usually a three-part board with one-third of people living on the land, one-third living in the larger community, and then one-third being other experts or stakeholders of some kind. So there's sort of a system of um, more democratic system, representative system of the communities uh, where the land is. Um, and so we've been building up this coalition that's been working this model in New York City. It's not uh, terribly uh, popular amongst a lot of elected officials. That's changing now. Um, there's, I think, part of it's just a fear of sort of change and a uh, different approach to the model. Part of it is that real estate has a very tight grip on our election process uh, in New York City and state. Um, not naming any names, of course. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that is something that, that we have to be fighting um, as well. But we've seen over the last few years already, um, in the time that we've been, you know, organizing as an alliance, our alliance has grown to include um, dozens of organizations um, and continues to grow. You know, we've been meeting with the city uh, government, specifically HPD, the Housing and Preservation Department, uh, or D Department of Housing and Preservation. Uh, and 
you know, seen increased interest um, both from the city, from you know, funders, and especially, most importantly, from community groups. Um, there is one longtime CLT in New York City. It's called the Cooper Square Community Land Trust. Some people may have heard of it. It grew, um, I think it's a really great example of what's possible when people get together and organize. Uh, I grew out of organizing against uh, Robert Moses back in the 1950s and er the first waves of urban renewal in New York. Um, and you know, we're able to basically win uh, several dozen buildings, both from the city and also ensure their uh, rehabilitation. Um, purely through sort of really intensive organizing of the community, um, squatting, you know, protests, going to city council's offices. Uh, they were able to, to win that, and they are still now, you know, in lower Manhattan, one of the most expensive neighborhoods in New York City, arguably, uh, able to offer rents, you know, starting at $400 a month um, to families. So they're an amazing example of what's possible. We've since grown, similar to the story of worker co-ops, um, in the last few years, from having just one CLT to having now, I think we're at four that are, you know, three of those are just starting to emerge um, and starting to acquire their first properties. Um, and many more organizations that we've been working with um, that are just starting to sort of build out their vision for this. Uh, so I think I'm pretty much at time. <laughs> but, um, but, you know, we've got a shrug, so I guess I can just keep going. <laughs> um, but just, I guess I'll just say that I think we tend to talk about, um, a lot of people feel a sense of hopelessness when it comes to uh, the process of gentrification that it's somehow inevitable or um, it's too late. And I think we're seeing from all fronts, from the tenant organizing, um, from people getting, you know, getting their neighbors together, fighting back against landlords, to the CLT fight, um, to the housing co-ops, et cetera, that that's, you know, New Yorkers are stubborn and they're not gonna just let themselves be walked over by by developers and that when we get together and we fight together, we can win real change. So, if you want to talk more about that, I'm happy to do that later. So I want to stay on that level you were just on for a second about um, what's possible on the scale of this work, and, and um, you know we talk about you know the, the three million dollars for worker co-ops and the, the you know, dozens of worker co-ops that exist that didn't. And we talk about having you know four times as many CLTs from one to four. Um, and we talk about how the, the map has grown, and it's it's really exciting when you're in the sort of like in the weeds of it. And you're saying what we're doing is like quadrupling, but also then you step back and you look at the scope of, of capitalism and the size of the economy. Um, and so I wanted to ask at just a personal level for the the three of you who are so deep in this work and, and so committed to this work, um, what either in your worldview or your experience or your understanding of, of history or other parts of the world um, motivates you to, to keep working on these strategies and seeing them as a, as a vehicle for really sort of deep change at a, at a broad scale. And I can wait till somebody feels like they have an answer to that or wants to try to tackle that. You can ask a clarifying question. Are so you asking like what keeps us going? And like in this work or yes. Yes. yes, and like but like specifically like uh, yeah, sure. However you want however you want to take that. However you want to take that. If that's well, that makes it really right answer. <laughs> uh, I'm sure I'm gonna hear about this later. Um, <laughs> do you wanna <laughs> go at it? <laughs> Okay, so what keeps me from crying most days out of the week during this work <laughs> kind of implies that I'm not. Um, yeah, like, okay, so history is a good one, right? Um, the drastic changes in our political economy never happen without a fight. And it's unfortunate that a lot of the history of fight and resistance is lost because you know history is told by who wins and et cetera, et cetera. But I think about in particular New York with the history of like squatters' rights and squatters' resistance um, in the Lower East Side. And I pay attention to my reaction to the retelling of that history, which is so incredibly powerful. And I when I check check myself, um, 
and think, wow, I couldn't imagine this being possible now in terms of the level of resistance, the level of organizing, and the ability to like win something that seems so unwinnable. And I kind of sort of mourn that, or mourn that kind of reaction as to why I think things are not possible. And I remember that like so many ways of just surviving and trudging through life are happening in these like small struggles. So I do this work because I have to live and I would prefer my life to not be shitty. So <laughs> just, you know, so it's like I I I don't have a big kind of romanticizing pull that keeps me here, but it's one out of necessity. I have to be part of a food club because if I were not part of a food club, I wouldn't afford fucking food. So I have to do that. I have to do that labor. I have to do the mutual aid work because I like these people and would prefer to build my lives with them. And because my survival really does depend on other people that I build a common cause with. So it's not like a fun kind of prefigurative work for now until some particular date when the revolution happens and everything else is like a gravy train from then. Because um, it's not, right? I wouldn't be sitting in a meeting and having frustrating conversations with people that I like, kind of don't like if it weren't for our mutual survival and the urgency behind it. So a lot of it isn't like the, this work reminds me of my grandmother and my ancestors and that connection. Like I don't have that because I'm like dead inside a lot, but I do it out of necessity. I'm just putting a voice for people that like don't have those romantic feelings a lot. <laughs> Take it from like a pessimist person that like kind of side eyes the world. I do it because I need to survive and I need to eat and all these other things. That being said, the reason that I focus in terms of consciousness and political education, etc., is because in doing this history and solidarity economy that I'm doing as a grad student and in looking at these organizing practices, I find that the Achilles heel of what drive, like what ruins our projects is not having a shared sense of ethics and a shared sense of politics on a deep level. And so we kind of overlook that, but building businesses forever isn't necessarily going to bring us liberation or freedom. What's going to do that is having a very strong critique of capitalism and a strong sense of our twin fates with one another. I don't want to be a business owner, like ever. I don't even want to manage my own life most of the time. Like, put that to someone else, that'd be great. So I don't think that my freedom is tied up in like formal institutions that way, but I think it is when, or I know that it is, when I know that I have a shared sense, a sense of shared fate. And so that, Michael, is what <laughs> keeps me in this work, I guess, if that was even your question. Okay, bye. <laughs> Yeah, uh, just to maybe follow up on one aspect of the um, amazing answer. Uh, I think I have been really just motivated by or inspired by people that are coming together to do this out of necessity, one. Um, and because it's not easy being a worker owner and the process is not easy and there's a lot of time that has to go in and, and time that's like not paid for um, and and people are putting that in for the vision to create something different um, often because the alternative within capitalism is really awful and terrible and and so the the, I think what has inspired me most directly is working with individuals going through this process and their commitment um, and their ability to just like dream and, and for us to dream together um, and do the really like hard shit that it takes to get there and it's still a long process. Um, the, what you have to learn in terms of becoming, knowing the like financial pieces or the business, like running the business pieces is very challenging and very different. But I think that one of the things that McNaught 
does really well and hopes to do even better moving forward is um, bringing co-ops together for that to be more a shared experience and more just cooperative to cooperative support, which I feel that in the longer term creates like a stronger, more interdependent system, even though these cooperatives are still struggling within a very capitalist world and society, and that comes in in all kinds of ways into spaces where you know they're meeting with each other and they're together. Um, so that building uh, of the you know co-op to co-op support in that community is really important, and then building with a broader um, like solidarity economy community is is also part of that and hopefully part of that too. So um, I think it's also the potential of where it can go and knowing that you know you, there's a lot already here or that's growing. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I know. And I just, yeah, plus one to both of those uh, statements. Um, on to Zeta's point as well, I think seeing, yeah, waking up every day and seeing what other people are doing both inspires and makes me feel like, well, yeah, you don't have a choice. You got to get in there too. Um, and I think when when everyone is doing that, it gets easier and it gets more viable. Um, and especially here in New York City, it's a really interesting place because in a lot of ways uh, we have tremendous amounts of resources compared to a lot of other places. Um, and as we were talking about earlier, we are in a situation where we have a administration at the city level, um, which is, you know, over 8 million people live here, so it's not, it's more than a lot of states. Um, but we have this sort of like very geographically small, hyper dense um, state uh, that has supposedly this, you know, an administration that prides itself on being very progressive, a uh, city council that prides itself on being very progressive, and so there are um, ways to put their meat to the fire, um, and I think even more so than we've been doing. Um, and particularly now, you know, I think especially our mayor is really, and our governor as well, are really wanting to put themselves in opposition to the federal administration and to say, you know, we are the anti-Trump, um, and yet they continue to put their money in, you know, bad banks and, you know, do, you know, continue to perpetuate a lot of the same things that they say that are against Goldman Sachs um, employees are very invested, you know, in our city government as they are in our federal government, um, by which I mean just like literally Goldman Sachs representatives running our government um, at the city level. So there's a lot of hypocrisy, I mean, there's a lot of inconsistencies there uh, that I think can be pointed out and, and pressed on and, you know, assuming that the, the goodwill of the city council and administration is real and, uh, and there are opportunities there. So I think just seeing the tremendous amount of wealth and resources that we have in the city and the way that they're being extremely um, segregated and, you know, the inequality in our city is one of the worst in the country, and our country is one of the worst in the world. Um, and so just sort of living with those, um, what's the word there, like the dissonance of, uh, of having this rhetorically progressive city and both administration and the city, you know, our residents, and then having these realities of extreme inequality, um, of extreme police brutality, uh, you know, of extreme poverty, um, it's untenable, I think. So, and we're seeing that everywhere. And so things that we never thought could happen, both in a good and a bad way, are happening every day. Um, and, you know, hopefully we can be tipping the scales towards justice. Um, and I do think, you know, we have the numbers, ultimately, and if we can, coordination and sustainability and keep pushing, but um, seeing those resources like that $40 billion I mentioned earlier, which is a lot of money, <laughs> Um, being put towards, you know, wasteful uses and harmful uses that could be put towards positive uses. Um, that motivates me. So I want to ask just a couple of really specific follow-ups and then um, turn to y'all for questions. I know it's a Monday night, so I don't want to keep this going too late. Um, I guess first, of, uh, I just wanted to ask you, you can talk a little bit about what's coming up next weekend with the ECWD Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy. Uh, 
Awesome, thank you. And so it's something I've been thinking about every day for the last, like, I don't know how many months. But um, this weekend is the Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy, or ECWD. It's a conference, I think it's the oldest running work, worker co-op conference, or conference on workplace democracy in the country. Um, and it happens every two years, and it's for the entire Eastern region of the US. Um, and this year, it's in New York City. So we are combining it with our NICOF annual conference, and it's taking place Friday, June 9th, through Sunday, June 11th, at Fort Long Law um, campus, which is in Midtown, around Lincoln Center. And there's gonna be a bunch of workshops ranging from the nuts and bolts of forming a co-op, to you know, movement building um, with the cooperative movements and others. Um, so it's a variety of different topics on different areas and uh, really great speakers coming to present from across the entire e Eastern region of the US. And uh, yeah, we hope you can come. I have flyers with information. Um, on the back of the flyer is information about a fundraiser party we're throwing on Saturday night, which hopefully you all can also attend and support and proceeds will go to support ECWD and also NICNOC. Um, so I'll hand those out, I guess, later. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, I don't understand. You definitely can't come, it'll take one. Like if you're like, I'm gonna be in somewhere else. There is a cost to registration and sliding scale and all the information is on the website that's there. Uh, so, just as a uh, function of not keeping us too late, I think it was um, taking questions. So, let's try to get a couple at a time. Uh, yeah, over here. Uh, I just thank you all for uh, being here and, and talking to us. And it's clear that you know, you've dedicated your lives to meeting very concrete, vital needs for people in the community. And I'm just wondering uh, what some of your needs are, and if you ever have that thought during the day where it's like, Oh, if I had this resource or this many volunteers, I could get twice as much done. What exactly your pain points are in your day? Thank you. That's a great question. I heard Lauren gasp when you asked that. <laughs> yeah. Possibly the first one, so I need your help. 
Awesome, thank you. I think there's probably a couple of different projects that sort of reminds me of. Um, so does anybody want to start with any of those and we'll take another round? Go ahead. So I'll just start with like the water maybe's. Never in my life is gonna ask me that question. <laughs> <laughs> now it's your moment, it's the one you always dream of and like bitch out on Twitter about and now it's here and like what do you do? <laughs> uh, yeah. I was off, like yeah I need a shirt daddy, that's what I need, Get it. are you offering? Like what is this? Just walk after, okay, I'm ready. Um, so, my, <laughs> in order to do the work, it's funny, it's like you need the better conditions that you're advocating for in order to do the work to keep yourself advocating, right? So, like, Stable housing is a huge one. I teach um, geography at Hunter College, and my students do a final project at the end of the year where they investigate a problem within New York City and think through solutions, et cetera. And always the solutions that they come to is like, regardless of whatever the question was, it's like, okay, well, we just need guaranteed housing because we can't guarantee housing because it takes so much like burden and stress off of things. So the first thing is, buy me an apartment. The second thing, <laughs> Eliminate my student debt. Uh, the next thing is uh, be a decent person in meetings. Uh, don't take too, too much space. Volunteer to do the note taking job. Volunteer to do the traditionally like feminine work things in your activist spaces, please. And just respond to emails and just do those decent things. Um, so <laughs> these things aren't like <laughs> material per se. I mean, the house, yeah. Um, but yeah. Of course we need more people, of course we'd love to expand our breadth, but we need people that also have the capacity to do the kind of work that's required. And that I, I can't sit up here and be like, you know, Daniel, where um, when I'm also tired and like phone it in and things like that. So what I think what we need is a stronger sense of care and responsibility and also holding ourselves accountable. I'd say that this all falls under the umbrella of a lack of accountability um, in our own organizing spaces, wherever we organize from. I often joke that I think that our movement needs HR because we don't have like a stable organization that like calls you in and is like, you know what you did was wrong. And all this stuff that goes through it, it falls on certain people in your organizations or certain people that are, have particular skills or have particular bodies and et cetera and identities. So it would be the greatest thing if we had a sh an actual like urgent shared sense of care to have. Um, and I know that that might seem more like the woo answer than you were looking for. If you want to go the material route, we can have that conversation. Because I have these, and we all, I'm sure, have them. But I think that's what I would start with. Guaranteed housing, responding to your emails. Check your picture. Check your picture. Check your picture. So I'm gonna try to answer a little bit of all the questions uh, really fast or really. Um, I think what worker co-ops often say that they need is marketing support. And so, uh, you know, we have like a new kind of phrase we're using for right now, which is buy better, buy co-op. But that you yourselves um, should buy from co-ops. Uh, wherever there's a co-op uh, that you would like to purchase from, that exists in the industry that you need, and, and they exist in a variety of different industries um, and provide a variety of different services. So there's that directory there from Scenic. Um, we usually put out a worker co-op specific directory, which we'll have for the conference, so you can pick them up at the conference when you go. Um, and, um, and, so, and then we also have one online and on our website. So supporting co-ops that, that way is the most, I think, beneficial. Also, spreading the word about co-ops and helping you know spread those directories and that information far and wide. Uh, and um, I'm sure that there's other things, but that is really the one that comes up over and over again. Is, is really the support for those businesses to thrive and grow, um, so that they can also then support themselves and, and each other. So, um, and in terms of um, co-ops supporting co-ops. Um, Within the co-op movement, there is, for example, a bookkeeping cooperative that actually provides a lot of bookkeeping services for a lot of the cooperatives, and also is doing more financial training for co-ops. So they fill this like, really important gap or void in the ecosystem and do that really well. And, and there's other co-ops that do like printing or marketing support and 
So we've seen that happen in, in those ways. Um, and then again, I think like for worker co-ops, the connection to the broader solidarity economy um, means kind of that broader understanding of what that solidarity economy is, but can also help them in terms of creating more sustainable businesses that can, can grow, can provide locally, can identify local needs effectively, can build community wealth effectively. Um, and so that's just, a, I guess, a very short general answer. Um, and then there are like hybrid models of like consumer worker co-ops, which would be something you could look into and we can provide more info about later. Um, but there are also these hybrid models that exist. And then there's construction co-ops that exist that uh, a couple that you can you should definitely talk to and we can put you in touch with. And that um, there are organizations that provide legal support if you're thinking about forming um, a construction co-op and can help you think through what that would mean to form a nonprofit type of organization like that. Um, and so uh, we can definitely connect um, Around, around that. But I would start from talking to the construction co-ops that exist and um, how they work. So yeah, a couple points on these things. As far as uh, what we need, I think, yeah, just greater coordination and capacity. And and to that point, um, you know, I think there's a lot of like beating ourselves up and guilt and, and part of that comes also with the sort of like capitalist mentality of like we must always have more and be doing more. Um, and be producing, and it's obviously not a sort of um, accident that you know most people are like too literally too exhausted at the end of the day because they're, they're spending all of our time like trying to make money and get things done. Especially here in New York City, pay for our skyrocketing rent. Um, that to actually be able to do social work and community work is like I will not say impossible, but very difficult. Um, and so the capacity to actually do it at scale and to do it in a deep way is, is really difficult. So just to name that as like real, it's not like, you know, um, we just need everybody to sleep less and, um, no, we need to like also, the, that's sort of where the, the piece of like fighting against what we have and also building what we need in the same place at the same time are so vital because we need to be winning the affordable housing that lets people have the time to not, you know, be constantly choosing money and, um, getting rid of student debt, <laughs> forgiving all of our student debt, right? Not, that is not a separate struggle from building cooperative institutions. Um, and so, yeah, so that, that's number one. I think, yeah, to, the point, to the question around interconnection of co-ops, to the level of what Zidup was saying, I think, um, yeah, that's also about bringing more folks together and seeing it as a great vehicle for that. Um, a few months ago, Green Worker Cooperative, which Zidup mentioned earlier, which is an incubator and an academy for new worker co-ops in the South Bronx, um, hosted a panel, which I don't think had been done before, to my knowledge, that was bringing together um, people doing community land trust work, people doing housing co-op work, and people doing worker co-op work into one space to sort of each introduce the work they were doing and then also have a conversation about how our work is interconnected and like just a bunch of, just the fact of having people in the room together, there was like people from uh, low income housing co-ops were like, oh yeah, like we have a directory that we go to anytime we need construction or other things done. Like we should, we should see if there are any worker co-ops that do those things. <laughs> it was just like a light bulb going off and they're like, oh, well we're right here. We'll talk to you after the panel. So just having more spaces for things like that and for having directories and uh, I think with the internet and technology, um, we're in, it's easier than ever in some ways and also harder than ever because we're constantly inundated with information. Um, but then, um, and I think for us and for our vision for uh, community land trust specifically, I think part of why I'm so excited about, about the model is that it can be a physical place um, that can actually be like a locus for all of this organizing. So um, when you control your housing and your, and your land, that's not just residential, it can also be commercial, um, uh, what's the word when you have fun somewhere? Thank you, recreational. <laughs> recreational. Um, community spaces, etc. So that you can literally have a physical place where people can be coming together um, to live their lives, but also to have these kind of conversations and to be organizing and worker co-ops can get, you know, cheaper rent and on a CLT commercial space and etc. We can have a meeting space in the community center. So 
having, a, I think, you know, the internet and technology is really important and having all these conversations and information online, but at the end of the day, also physical both places like Starbar, like um, other community spaces uh, are also really critical for the physical coming together that can help facilitate all of this cross-sectoral solidarity work. Thank you. So I want to take one more round of questions. This gentleman in the back. Yes. Um, I've been involved, I've been here in Starbucks several times. Thank you guys. I've been here several times. Uh, here's my uh, question. Okay, this is how you signed up as well. What is your approach to the economic disparities, displacement, gentrification, and how can we set up tenant co ops to prevent it? What tools and tactics can tenant like getting property or getting land or taking over the building. Mm -hmm. And if you can teach tenant co-ops how to take it over before the landlord gets it, renovates it, put, it doesn't take a rocket scientist and we'll stay worked in mortgages uh, sometimes for the sales rep telemarketer. Um, you know, it you know, renovates the building, puts new doors, new lights, new chapters, mm -hmm. and what can tenants do to buy up the property and prevent it? Awesome. Um, Take a couple more, but I think let's work for this one. So, Laura, maybe you can tackle that one first. Right here in the front. Take those and then we'll, after this we'll move into the cocktails part of the cocktail and conspiracy, but we can keep conspiring. Um, <laughs> There's no one simple answer to that. There's a lot of strategies that are being tried. There's no magic bullet. Um, there are a lot of organizations and examples in New York City that we can learn from and that are also supporting this work. So as part of the New York City Community Land Initiative, which is the alliance I was talking about earlier nicely, um, you know, our focus is on housing. We have uh, groups like CATCH, which is Community Assisted Tenant Controlled Housing. They help um, buildings and, and groups of tenants convert to what's called a mutual housing association, which is a non-profit tenant controlled um, cooperative form of housing, um, where at least two thirds of the board are elected, you know, a full board is elected, but two thirds of the board are must be living in the housing, um, specifically for low income and extremely low income people. Um, there's also groups that are organizing uh, HDFCs, which is a very particular uh, legal structure in New York City, basically limited equity co-ops or low income co-ops earning under a certain amount of money where it's, you know, um, restricted how much you can buy and sell um, your apartment for. Um, the MHA or the Mutual Housing Association model that I mentioned is usually no equity, which means, um, you know, it makes it much more affordable, but in exchange, people aren't building assets in the traditional way that you think about wealth building for a family, but instead the wealth for the, the assets stay in the building for the next family that's going to live there so it stays affordable. Um, in the long term. So those are a couple of examples, and there's, I think, hundreds um, of these co-ops, uh, if not, I want to say hundreds, across the city. Um, they are a lot harder to establish now, obviously. You know, a lot of them came out came about in the 80s in the time of disinvestment in New York City when landlords were walking away from buildings that were in extremely bad shape and leaving them occupied. Um, so tenants were taking them over through sweat equity and rehabilitating their buildings and then um, turning them into cooperative ownership structures. Today it's a much harder process um, because the 
speculative value of land is so incredibly high. Um, but that's where the advocacy piece comes in. So it's part of um, nicely our structure. You know, we have working groups, everything from the nitty gritty of door knocking to creating popular education materials, which is just on the question earlier about how do you reach new audiences. Um, we spent a lot of time, years actually, developing popular education materials from comic books to board games to pop-up flyers to visuals to a video um, to help explain to people who learn in different ways to, to engage people and who are coming at this from different intersections and, and places in, in, the, in the work. Um, and then finally, you know, the policy piece is probably in some ways the, the most important as far as making sure that these are not just isolated, you know, one group tenant struggles for 20 years here and wins one building. That's amazing for those you know, 150 tenants, but um, what about you know the rest of New York City? So working at the policy level to be pushing for pathways and changes that can actually change the way that housing works in New York City. And there are a number of laws, many laws, that we could easily, well, in theory, could easily change um, that would make a huge difference in New York City as far as um, our housing crisis. That's why the, you know, the housing crisis is manufactured, is not naturally occurring. Um, and it is a deliberate choice um, that benefits largely the real estate industry. Um, and you know, indirectly benefits uh, a number of people in power in our city and directly does not benefit most of New York City residents. Um, so we have, you know, I, I won't bore people with like the specifics, but we, we have a, I think a 10 or 12 point policy platform on our website that you can check out. I'm happy to talk policy with any wants in the room who want to talk about like tax liens. Um, there are just a lot of really silly ways that we basically privatize housing. New York City actually has a lot of control over housing. It likes to pretend that uh, it's, that's all gone and you know it's all private now and they have no sway. Um, but there's actually a lot of ways the city directly and indirectly has um, decision-making power over what happens to properties in New York City. And right now, a lot of them are getting sold off for a dollar to private developers. So there's a lot that can be done there, especially with that $40 billion budget that we mentioned. Um, so yeah. Uh, I think with the how do we spread the word about co-ops, because this is something a lot of worker co-ops have been thinking about, but because we have gotten all this city support for the development of worker co-ops, uh, part of what we want to push for in the coming year, potentially longer than that, is a public education campaign. So I think we're dreaming, like we want the city to support us in having ads on the subways about, edu like to educate people about like co-ops. And we think that there is quite a bit of support from the city already, and that that's growing. Um, there's the Progressive Caucus of the City Council that just came out with this, uh, their own platform of progressive policies for 2018, and worker co-ops are listed as number two or three. Within that, so we want to take advantage of that and actually demand that they help us inform the broader public about cooperatives. So that's one big thing. And then secondly, we are working with Scenic to really think through and strategize like marketing strategy and um, messaging. And so that includes like having better branding around the solidarity economy and co-ops in general and better messaging, like honing in on that. Uh, really well, and uh, doing work together uh, around marketing. And there's a variety of different ideas under that from creating like some sort of um, mechanism for exchange uh, amongst co-ops and, and a debit card amongst co-ops um, uh, for the exchange of services and goods and things like that uh, to, to various other things. But I think that um, first we, we, we want to hone in on that messaging and then spread that in the ways that we can. Um, and then, oh, on, on the legal front, for us, um, specifically for worker co-ops, on the state level, there's a number of things that could be done right now around supporting business conversions, which would help to really bring our movement to scale. And, um, and so, you know, we've had some support there from a couple of politicians, but um, but there's there's been some existing law um, laws on the books that should just be like reinvigorated, and that it includes like having a state center for uh, to support conversions or like democratic employee ownership, 
Uh, it includes like a capital gains tax exemption for businesses that do convert. That would really incentivize businesses to do that. And then resources for training and support for businesses that aren't converting. Um, and so that's one of the big things. And the other big thing is around the incorporation's status for, for businesses, really the different ways that co-ops can incorporate don't really respond effectively to the realities of co-ops. So figuring out what's like a good incorporation model or within the existing models, how to improve them, mm -hmm. make them better. Um, yeah, so those are some of the things. Yeah, so I think that last point is really important. Where is this cord? Um, <laughs> things are happening. Okay. So yeah, I think your last point is uh, really crucial because as you were speaking, I was like, oh, damn, like to be a worker owner, you have to really be uh, all of a sudden an economist and you have to be a lawyer. Um, you have to be really familiar with incorporation laws and things like that. And so there's, I, I really can't stress enough the amount of onboarding that happens to own your own business with other people. So there's that formal onboarding and then there's just being in the work with one another, which is widely underestimated and undervalued in terms of building trust. So that's like a thing I'd like to triple underline as someone who's not a worker owner, um, but something like as organized in this space for a while. Uh, so I can't answer those technical questions about a particular law or um, any kind of the nitty gritties of like building a worker owned business because it's not my ministry. Um, but it is in the space in which I work. So in terms of, you know, preaching beyond the choir and just expanding our voice, uh, this cuts a lot of different ways. Um, Adrian Marie Brown, who's an organizer, um, and does a lot of great workshops on like pleasure activism and self-care and how to prevent burnout and things like that, has this really great line about a way to frame our work, which is how do we frame our work and make our work the most pleasurable thing that we can participate in. And like, isn't that just a delicious line? Like, how do we make it the sexier option? I feel like this is the fourth time I've said sexy in this thing. <laughs> do that what you will. But yeah, um, there's a lot of great uh, alluring things about capitalism. There's also the alluring sense of being completely overwhelmed and overcome with like this uh, sense of being under something as well. And I can't deny that there is also pleasure in a painful experience too. This is going somewhere else. <laughs> the point is, <laughs> there's a lot of affective reasons why we participate in systems that do not serve our interests. Why would we be doing this thing from like the, the, around the 1650s till now that does not serve our interests unless there was some kind of pain or pleasure involved in that. So we really do like, talk to someone about that. Um, in terms of, so this is usually the point at which I start with, um, depending on my audience, <laughs> which is, uh, one is the historical route. We've been doing these things forever, right? And isn't it a cool kind of God trick to put all of these things in the same place and part of the same political movement? And can't you see that these are not only uh, strategies that resist um, a dominant kind of oppressive system, but exist whether that other system existed or not, right? But it is kind of, not to get too essentialist about it, but kind of the way that we organize socially regardless of the political or economic circumstances. The solidarity economy is a constant across different political changes, even if you think of the most uh, utopic visions that still didn't serve people's needs. You still had a solidarity economy within that. You still had a way of meeting our needs and a sense of mutualism there. So tapping into that historical process is really um, important for me. Uh, so I lead workshops about the solidarity economy a lot to a lot of different people, to people that are more primed, um, that are doing some kind of organizing that relates to that, um, to people that have never heard it, and using the examples of just what the things are, like democratically managed things, things that are non-exploitative, -exploit so you don't have to get into a long uh, 
Marx's conversation about surplus and surplus allocation and things like that to talk about like exploitation, right? But you really can meet people where they're at and also the, the importance of the personal story. So I know that these aren't like the hardcore like branding and like messaging and all these other things, but <laughs> so don't do them. Um, but it really requires um, us to understand the work that we've already been doing, but also framing it in a way that we've never familiarized ourselves with before and make it seem like the best option for meeting our needs because it is. We know it is. You guys know what it is, right? Um, so yeah, I think I'd end with that. Thank you. Let's get a round of applause for all of our panelists. Sidib's comment about public education reminded me that if anybody reads Korean, I have access to a Korean elementary school curriculum about co-ops that I would really love to see in English. Um, it's actually a public school curriculum, so if anybody wants to do some translation work, come find me. Well, I know a guy. Um, uh, thank you all so much for coming out. Um, uh, Evan is over here with Scenic and Solidarity NYC stuff, including the directory that we've alluded to many times. Um, SUDIP has flyers about the Eastern Conference Workplace Democracy. If you like listening to us talk, you're going to love listening to hundreds of people talk for much more time uh, in Fordham over a weekend. Uh, it's going to be great. Uh, and uh, tip your bartender, hang out. Thank you for coming. <laughs>